Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father, through Jesus Christ, our living Savior. Amen. As we continue our series on the church and the things, the lessons that we can learn from the early church, both for ourselves and for our church today, today we look at the story of Stephen as it's recorded in Acts chapters 6 and 7. I invite you to open one of the Pew Bibles and follow along as we look at these verses. In the Pew Bible, you can find them beginning on page 774. Page 774, and then continuing on to page 776. We start in Acts chapter 6 with the first nine verses. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing... The Grecian Jews among them complained against those of the Aramaic-speaking community because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the Word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer in the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, did great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from the members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia. These men began to argue with Stephen. Then skipping over to chapter 7, verse 2, the first part of the verse. To this he, that is Stephen, replied, Brothers and fathers, listen to me. And then skipping down to verse 51 of chapter 7. You stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears, you are just like your fathers. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your fathers did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was put into effect through angels, but have not obeyed it. When they heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. Then Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. This is God's Word. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord of the church, your fellow members of God's church, members of God's family. There was a problem in the church in Jerusalem. (gasps) Shocking, right? guess their church wasn't perfect either. The problem was actually related to the growth of their church. As you may remember, on the day of Pentecost, about 5,000 people were added to the church in one day. Now, of course, that wasn't a problem. It was a wonderful blessing from God. But it, it led to a problem in one of the ministries in their church, their ministry to those in need. Last week, you may remember that we looked at how the early believers showed their love for one another by by caring for each other, especially those in need. 
Here Luke tells us that the desire to, to help those in need had developed into a daily food distribution program. Every day, food was collected for the poor and, and then it was distributed to those in need. The problem was that some people were being overlooked. The Grecian widows. No, it wasn't intentional on the church's part. It, it just happened, as it often does when the church grows rather rapidly and becomes large. You know, you, it's hard to keep track of everybody, and you, some people get overlooked. Rather than just ignore the problem and, and allow it to create divisions in the church, the apostles decided to meet it head on. They called a meeting of, of all the believers in Jerusalem. They said, look, it wouldn't be right for us to neglect the ministry of the Word of God and, and wait on tables. And then they proposed the solution. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and we'll give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the Word. So that's what they did. They chose seven men who, who, from among them. And among those men was a man named Stephen. A man, as Luke notes, who was full of faith in the Holy Spirit. What a beautiful description for any leader in the church. Any church council member, any elder, any Sunday school teacher or a pioneer leader. They were full of faith in the Holy Spirit. Actually, what a beautiful description for any Christian. When his fellow believers asked him to take on this responsibility, this, this ministry to those in need, Stephen said yes. He didn't make any excuses. He didn't say he was too busy. He said, sure. I'd be happy to serve my Lord in this way, happy to serve my fellow believers. And he did. And he did a fine job. They all did. The widows were all taken care of, including the Grecian widows. The apostles were freed up so they could devote their time to the prayer and the ministry of the Word. And the church was blessed. What a great example for us, for, it, for every Christian, no, we don't have a, a food distribution ministry here at Trinity. Well, we do have people who help out at the local food pantry here in Crete, but we don't have a, a ministry here at church specifically for Trinity members to you know, provide food. I don't know, maybe someday we will. But in the meantime, that doesn't mean you can't be involved in service like Stephen. There are countless ways that you can be involved. Many, many different ways that you can use the gifts and talents God has given you to serve Him and to serve others. Everything from helping out with Sunday school and vacation Bible school to senior ministry to puppet ministry to prison ministry to pause with a purpose and all kinds of other ones. There are all kinds of ways that you can help out and, and serve your Lord. And no, I'm too busy is not an excuse. It's a sin. Now well, granted, when your mom just died and you're trying to get your dad settled in a nursing home and your, your son's graduation is a week away and they, they just gave you ten new accounts and, and five new projects at work, I understand. There are times in our lives when things are just crazy and you're scrambling to keep up and being involved in ministry is just not going to work. Not... Not right then. But when I have time for everything else, including golf and fishing and shopping with my friends and summer baseball and summer soccer and trips to Great America and the Mall of America, when I have time for everything else, and I, I, but then I don't have time for serving. And it's just an excuse. A poor excuse. A sinful excuse. Jesus gave his life in service to us. 
and living for us and dying for us as our Savior. He likewise is the one who has given us the, the gifts and talents that we have. And now I'm going to turn around and say, sorry, Jesus, uh, you know, I, I'm too busy. I, I don't have time to use the gifts and talents that you have given me to, to serve you and others. So, sorry. How can I say that? Lord, forgive me. Forgive us. Forgive us for our selfishness and our misplaced priorities. Forgive us for being so ready to make excuses instead of being ready to serve. Forgive these sins of ours. Wash them all away in Your holy, precious blood. And help us Help us to be more like you, more like Stephen. Help us to recognize the gifts and talents that you have given us. Help us to recognize the opportunities that we have to use those gifts and talents to serve you and to serve others. And then help us, like Stephen, to serve you as best we can wherever you call us to serve. As our story continues, we notice that Stephen not only was active in serving, but was also active in sharing his faith with others. Like many in the early church, Stephen was one who just couldn't keep the good news about the risen Savior to himself. He had to talk about it. And apparently, he was pretty good at it too. So good, in fact, that the enemies of Jesus couldn't stand it anymore. Luke tells us later on in chapter 6, they could not stand up against his wisdom or the spirit by which he spoke. So, they decided to silence him. They brought in some men who brought false accusations against Stephen. They accused him of blaspheming the temple, accused him of trying to get rid of the customs and, Moses, the, and laws that Moses had given them. He was arrested, brought before the Sanhedrin, the very group that had condemned Jesus to death. Now what would he do? Would he clam up? Would he keep quiet about his Savior out of fear for his own life? Would he even maybe deny Jesus the the way Peter had done? No. With the help of the Holy Spirit, Stephen spoke up boldly about his Savior Jesus. He told the Jewish leaders that he worshipped the same God as Abraham, God of their forefathers. He assured them that he had no intention to try to get rid of the customs or laws that Moses had given them, but that he was careful to obey those laws unlike their fathers had done. He reminded them how their fathers had persecuted and Moses, even refused to obey him at times. And then he, he concluded his message with these words. You stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears, you are just like your fathers. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your fathers did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was put into effect through angels, but have not obeyed it. Those are pretty strong words, weren't they? Stinging words. Words that were meant to lead them to see their sins, to break their stiff necks and hard hearts and and to repent. Stephen's words are meant to do the same with us. To lead us to see our sins and repent. Like the people that Stephen was speaking to, we too can be pretty stiff-necked sometimes. Pretty stubborn. We know what God's Word says. We know what it says, for example, about cursing and swearing. We know God says it's wrong but we do it anyway. 
We know what God says about living together with our boyfriend or girlfriend. We know God says it's wrong. But we do it anyway. We know what God's Word says about talking back to our our teachers at school or our parents at home. We know He says it's wrong. But we don't care. We don't want to listen to what God's Word says. We want to do what we want. Yes, just like the people Stephen was speaking to, we too have been given God's laws. And we haven't obeyed them. Like the two-year-old who is told not to jump on the sofa, and no sooner do you turn around than he or she is jumping up and down on the sofa. You and I have knowingly, and stubbornly, broken God's commands over and over again. Stephen's words cut us to the heart too. And lead us to run to our Savior for forgiveness. Jesus is the righteous one. The holy one that God sent to be our Savior. To live a, a perfect life. A righteous life. Not a life of stubborn disobedience. But a, a life of perfect obedience, willing obedience to all of His commands. Jesus did that for you and me as our Savior. And then in an, in an awesome act of, of service to you and me and all people, Jesus gave His life on the cross to make us righteous. To take away all of our sins, including our, our stubborn disobedience. To make us holy and righteous and pure in the eyes of God. Because of Him, we are forgiven. Because of Him, we are saved. Because of Him, you and I can look forward to seeing the glory of God one day and seeing the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God and living with God in His presence forever. Repent of your sins. You're rebellious and stubborn ways. Look to Jesus as your Savior. Fortunately, many of the people that Stephen was speaking to did not respond with repentance and faith. As Luke tells us, they became angry. They gnashed their teeth at Stephen. And then, When Stephen dared to tell them about Jesus, that he actually saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God, they covered their ears and began yelling at the top of their voices. They grabbed Stephen, dragged him out of the city and began stoning him. And even then, Stephen confessed his faith. He prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then just before he died, he prayed that Jesus would not hold this sin against them. Again, what a marvelous example for you and me. Have you ever found yourself in a situation like Stephen? In a hostile environment? Surrounded by people who, shall we say, are not exactly friends of Jesus? People who challenge you in your faith. People who don't believe what the Bible says and ridicule anybody who does. Maybe it was in school in science class when the professor started talking about evolution and the origin of the world. Or maybe it was in the break room at work where some of your coworkers started talking about various world religions, including Christianity and how they're all basically the same. Or maybe it was one night when you were hanging out with your friends at Starbucks and the conversation turned to homosexuality and gay marriage because one of their friends recently came out and announced that he was gay. Suddenly you become nervous, reluctant to speak up, reluctant to share what you believe, what what the Bible actually says. You're afraid how they might respond. 
afraid that they might make fun of you for what you believe, afraid they might even become angry at you and pelt you with insulting comments. Ever found yourself in a situation like that? Don't be afraid to speak up for Jesus. Yes, I know that's the fear and the temptation. It's exactly what Satan wants you to do, to to keep quiet, to keep your mouth shut and your Savior to yourself. Do your best to resist that temptation and that desire. And speak up for your Savior. Because the people there need to hear it. If those classmates of yours, if those unbelieving co-workers or friends of yours are ever going to be rescued from Satan and, and from the darkness of sin and brought into the light of Jesus Christ, somebody has to tell them. Who's that somebody going to be? If they don't hear the truth about Jesus from you, if they don't hear the truth of God's Word from you, who are they going to hear it from? TV? Internet? That professor in your science class? Out of love for your Savior and love for those people, speak up. Be respectful. By all means, be respectful. But be honest, too. Tell them the truth about Jesus, the truth about God's word sa- what God's Word says. No, they may not want to hear it at the time. And yes, they may make fun of you or put you down because of your narrow-minded Christian beliefs. But they need to hear it. May God the Holy Spirit. Give us the courage, the confidence, and the strength to speak up and for our Savior Jesus wherever we are, with friends and with enemies too, even with our dying breath. The story of Stephen is a powerful story, a moving story. One that teaches us an important lesson about the church and what the church is all about. The church is a group of people, a family of believers who serves their Savior and shares their Savior whenever they can. Amen.